right, Zig coming in on the top. Today on the show, we have Brian Crum. Brian is a singer-songwriter based out of Chicago. His band is The Great Crusades, but now he's embarking on a solo endeavor. The solo outfit is Brian Crum in his bar, Fly Friends. The new album is Just Fade Away. It's available on all streaming platforms. It's really cool when you can hear an artist take a different turn, but still be themselves. And I think Brian does that in this record. It's a step from The Great Crusades, but... Not far from home. We're going to listen to a track off the record. The title track, Just Fade Away. Check it. No one else would. Just Fade Away, off the album Just Fade Away, Brian Crum and his bar fly friends. Available on all streaming platforms. Check it out. It's cool. He's got like uh, Eddie Vedder-ness in, in, these, uh, in these cuts. Or he's definitely got Tom Waitsy-isms in, in a lot of the Great Crusades, but this one brings out the vetter. I don't know. I dig it, and I think you guys will as well. Um, before we get into this conversation, i got to point out, when I called Brian, he was at his daughter's soccer game. So you're going to hear soccer happening and strange wind, and there's some sound issues on this episode that I could not correct or fix i've done my best to make it sound the best it possibly can and uh, it's a bummer because he says some really insightful stuff that sometimes is gusted away in the wind but that's poetic right anywho if you guys can like rate review and subscribe to the podcast on any of the podcast platforms it helps me keep talking to cool guests like brian and share an insight with you so without further ado here's my conversation with brian but anyway yeah I love Cleveland. I've been there uh, quite a few times. I played at the, uh, what is the place called? The Grog Shop. Is that oh, okay. in Cleveland? Yeah, yeah. Very cool. And uh, my wife bought me a membership to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Oh, yeah? Because uh, I was really excited because Warren Zevon, one yeah. of my all-time heroes, was nominated this year. But he did not make the cut. So the plan was that I was going to buy tickets if he actually got inducted and just go be there you know yeah because uh it's just like uh one of my heroes you know what what was the record he he came out with like uh his last one right when he knew he had cancer and like yeah his story is like the wind yeah Yeah, uh, yeah yeah last one and uh he did that after he you know knew that he was terminal and instead of going through the typical chemo process, he went and made a record, you know, yeah. and all of his friends showed up. And um, I was really hoping that he got inducted, um, that he would get inducted this year. I know his, his son, Jordan, is also a singer-songwriter, and uh, he was campaigning for him pretty hard, you know. How do you – it's but, like uh, that's the most rock and roll story, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like – how yeah. does that not? Why is that not in yet? It's uh, well, he, he and he was. He was very uh, out front about you know the life that he led. He, he was like, I got to be Jim Morrison for about you know twenty years longer than Jim Morrison did. You know, so right. it's like he did live the rock and roll lifestyle. You know, I think he was, I think he was sober though for the for the uh, for like the majority of his. Well, the, you know, the end of his life and right. then uh, might have slipped back a little bit when he found out that he was terminal. But um, Well, at that point, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, when to live it up, when to live it up. <laughs> like, Trank. <laughs> yeah. But anyway. How, how'd you get into Warren Zevon? Let's let's start it with that. Um, well, good question. Um, I probably got into him the same way that everyone else did by hearing uh, Werewolves of London. First of all, you know, I think most people know that tune. And then I just sort of did a, sort of doing a deep dive during the pandemic, actually. And because um, there was a, a night, every night that it was after dinner and the kids were, my kids were doing uh, homework and I was doing the dishes and I was like, which Warren's Yvonne album can I listen to tonight? And I just said, <laughs> just started you know 
diving into his whole catalog, and I think a lot of people have done that, you know. So I would say he's a, he's a major influence on this last record, this new record that came out, and him and you know Dylan. So um, speaking of Ohio, uh, Chrissy Hine, from the Pretenders, another major influence. Uh, her uh, her lyric writing and her just the fact that she was a band leader, woman band leader, uh, for the whole you know career of the Pretenders has been hugely inspiring to me. You know, right? Well, and just all around badass. They just put out a new re- or a single. I think the Pretenders uh, did they? Yeah, they just put out a new single. It's called "Let the Light In." Um, and like, oh, nice. she, and like, I think during the pandemic, they put out a record, or she put out a record with the guitar player they have now. That's like a, a Dylan cover record. So is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's know. it's some deep cuts. I'll, I'll I'll send you the link to it. Um, yeah, please do. Yeah, yeah. That's so like to kind of dive in. So with uh, just fade away, like yes, uh, you you would you'd have a shot of whiskey a night and just work on writing a tune. And like yes. I'm guessing that's after after listening to a record, so I'm starting to hear a little bit of like during the world shutting down, like a schedule was kind of formed, like, and I really relate to that because when when everything shut down, that's what I did. It's like I I, sure. I gave sure. myself like, all right, wake up, learn this, work on this, write for an hour, and that's you know I mean just kind of the routine. So is yeah, that- it was it was really my wife's idea. Um, she was like saw me moping around you know saw me like most people were like you know can't leave the house really can't go anywhere the kids are at home at school everybody's working from home you know and it's like uh, it's like are you gonna do something or are you just gonna like uh pace the hallway and uh you know so she she came up with the idea and then um i was actually at a a bit of a writing block my band, The Great Crusades, which started in my job. I date myself, but the first record came out in 1997. And so we, were, we had some great success overseas, never really took off in the U.S. that much. But, um, you know, that's not that unusual for, for rock bands. I had reached a point where I was like, I just didn't know what to write about anymore because the uh, Great Crusade sort of had this uh, very distinct style where we were like uh, sort of heavily influenced by, you know, the replacements, Tom Waits, Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. And we just really focused on like that high energy, like live show. And sort of an element of a dark, smoky, mysterious presence. And I just ran out of stuff to write about, basically. And then um, when I, so when I, you know, the pandemic happened, I started trying to write a song. I gave myself an hour to try to write a song. And I um, didn't really think I had that much to write about, but uh, come to find out that I did, I wrote, wrote like a, 25 tunes in 25 days and then um now the 11 songs that have sort of made it to the record was were the ones that sort of stood out between me and my uh, longtime friend christian motor who produced the record so that's kind of what happened got it well you know it's like giving that that small window of time to like kind of really hone in on a thing and kind of step out of it because I, I did a, a dive on um, the Great Crusades and like it's interesting like from like the first record there's like this high energy and then it goes into the 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 dark depths of like weights like bar kind of like aura you know what I mean like yeah you guys, you yeah it's really like it's a really unique tone in like I listened to your uh, I listened to Just Fade Away before diving into the Great Crusades and like. It was interesting because it's a completely different style. 
Like there's there's some crossover. I feel like uh, Steve and the Miracle Track Four, Steve and the Miracle. That one, I felt like Steve and the Miracle one, Three. Yeah, yeah, that could have been that could have been a great Crusade song. But like everything else, really had like a completely different approach to it, and like. And that always kind of like when I see certain bands that have like a very unique uh, blend to their their sound, like is like uh-huh. you know what I mean. Like when you develop who we are and this is what we sound like as a songwriter, there's always a little bit more going on. So, do you think that was fr- was that from the War on Zion and like uh, the Dylan influence and like diving into stuff like that? So I I, I think the the approach of the record was like. A- was like uh, a lot to do with Chris Motor, the producer, and, and also my like uh, lifelong friend, who's also a member of the Great Crusade. Great Crusades. Um, he has really hit like a sweet spot, I think, uh, as far as the his production work. He also has his own product uh, project called the Kinetic Council, which you can you can look up. Um, the kinetic council and i think he just heard these demos of the stuff that i sent him and just sort of took it into his own direction um and it just you know each song sort of took on its own sort of sort of uh life you know what i mean yeah 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 because it's it's interesting because it's really distant from the Great Crusades in a in a lot of like sonic ways like or structure ways. Um, yeah. So di- oh, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Um, the Montrose Saloon is that kind of like where the Barfly Friends are like accumulated. Yes. Okay. So and I started doing that. I started doing a residency there in uh, 2021. On the fifteenth of the month, every month, and um, a lot of the people that played with me on those shows ended up playing on the record too. Not necessarily on purpose, but just because, just because they're friends of mine, you know. And uh, and um, I, I know that uh, other people will call in like a. Uh, ringers or whatever you know to to play on the record like known names but right. all these you know probably 20 people or so we're just friends you know so it's it's like that's another way of making a record it's like we can't call in you know i don't know All the people I'm thinking of are passed away. But <laughs> <laughs> well, even even harder to call them in. <laughs> yeah, we can't call like Paul Westerberg or something like that from the replacements to come to a guest spot. It's it's like, well, why don't we just call in you know some of our friends and have them play on the record? And, uh, that's kind of how it works. Oh, it's always worked for for the Great Crusades too, you know. Just people that we know. We're surrounded by a, like a huge pool of talented folks. So it's like, why not just call them in and see if they, if they have free time, you know. And Well, you know, it's like a kind of being in that spot. So as far as like the Great Crusades, like do you guys like, I mean, up until 2020, would it be kind of like record tour um in mostly out of the country is that kind of yeah 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 okay yeah we we probably toured in in, uh europe and especially germany uh, we had a um, probably the uh geez i think the first tour that we did over there was in 1999 so we just kept going back bigger and bigger following and uh Hopefully we still have similar you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, started playing, you know, bigger shows, bigger festivals and and now we're going back in uh in June, playing a couple festivals over there and, and then ten 
club dates. So yeah, um, it's been like a, it's been like a second kind of home, you know, for us to go to. And now we've made such great friends over there, and some people that we met over there. Have, at least one person have mo- has moved to the U.S. and gotten married to one of our friends, and it's like crazy. It's like, yeah, it's like that's that's one of the great things about playing music. I think you know, no matter if you're making a ton of money off of it or just doing it for fun, is that just the people that you meet, especially the people that love music, come out to see your shows. Is that that's the best part of music for me. It's just like pulling into a a town that you haven't been to for a couple of years and seeing all the friends. Not only do you hear the old tunes, but also you're interested in the music. It's what, like, it's, it's a, it's a, success is measured in a million different ways and a lot of it i feel you know a lot of the the standard is some type of wealth some type of richness and sure. doing any type of type of creative endeavor but especially music when it's it's successful in a way when others are involved with it so that's yeah. like a, that's a richness that you get the experience that no one else can experience or like that's like, that's more than, than a dollar sign can like, uh, highlight how valuable that is. And that's it's gotta be absolutely. a huge trip to be like across the world and feel that. Yeah. I mean, I'm we're by no means to even close to like a freaking, you know, nature, Bon Jovi or something like that that does like you know a hundred dates in a row or something like that you know but uh, it's like when we do our tours it is pretty special it is like uh, even though you know we might be playing clubs we might be playing you know smaller festivals it's like a huge attraction I think for everyone that, that plays music with me it's like the opportunity to have the stuff that you've worked on for so long, you know, and put so many hours into it to get in, in front of people. It's just like a huge thrill, you know. Definitely. And, and to get yeah. positive feedback back, <laughs> you know, and to have a sure, group of sure. guys that are behind the message, you know, it's there's nothing like that. And even if yeah. it resonates with only three people, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's probably more potent, like playing a room of like a hundred or two hundred people that are real into it, than like a stadium of twenty five hundred. You know what I mean? Like, you, it, yeah, it becomes too numb at that point. So that's I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I that's... mean, you know how it is. It's like you put so many. I, I don't think people realize that how many hours you know you put into not just the. I mean, for me, it's like the. Uh, it's not only the hours that you uh, put into the actual production of a song. Let's just say one song. It's also the hours that you spend thinking about that particular song. Like, um, because I know that uh, for myself, it's not just sitting down at a table and writing down lyrics and stuff. It's like, what else could I do to that song to finish it you know what i mean so it's, it's i don't think people necessarily realize that of course you have the song some songs that just happen you know which to be honest with you a lot of the songs on this new record did happen like that and i sort of surprised myself because they were the music and the lyrics were done a lot of times on this record for in like an hour, an hour and a half, I think that sent myself a great message that you don't have to, you don't have to write, you know, 500 verses if 
you can write two lines that sort of summarize what you're trying to say. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That really hit the point. Wait. And then it's also easier to remember the lyrics <laughs> in a live situation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's one thing, like, I was watching, um, gosh, what's the, the German TV show you guys did? Uh, oh, Rock Palast. Yeah, yeah, I, I watched both of those, and I'm, like, going through this tunage, and I'm like, man, like, I for when I write a new tune, and, like, I have to perform it, I need, I need lyrics for a while before it just comes out, and even still, I mix crisscross verses and stuff, and I'm yeah. listening, and like, some of the Great Crusade songs, I'm like, man, <laughs> I don't know how you're pulling that off. That's a lot of practice there. <laughs> They, uh, they, uh, it's for me, I'm sure it might happen for you too, but there's always these, uh, there's certain songs that I can remember, like the drop of the uh, drop of the hat. And then there's other songs that like, it's almost like a, a different person wrote them or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, it's something to do with the brain chemistry, you know, like, uh, Certain lines don't go into a certain part of the brain or something. I don't know. It's yeah. It's I. It, I think it's part of it's like muscle memory of of narrative somehow. You know, what I mean, you're like if yeah. I can say the the two the first two words, the rest fall out. <laughs> right, right. And you see, like you see people like Joe Strummer do, like this song's called "London's Calling," you know, and says like the whole first uh-huh. line, and that's how. Okay, that's how he does it. I get it. Um, yeah. What are some songs on this record that like came together within that hour all like what are which ones like did, as far as like the experience of writing it was so simple which ones were Well, those? Just Fade Away was the first one that really came together in a, in a matter of uh I would say 40 minutes and the lyrics and it was you know, based on probably past relationships, you know, and uh, just the whole feeling of uh, the basis, I think, was uh, this of it was uh, watching a, this is going to sound really old fashioned, but the, the uh, story of like watching a plane take off when you could still do that, like from the, uh, I know in St. Louis at Lambert Airport, there was a watching area, you know, um, that you could, after you drop the people off, you could stand outside and like sit at the print table and stuff and like watch planes take off. And that's kind of where that story began, that song. And then Stephen the Miracle 3 was another one that uh, based, it was based on uh, another a festival that we played at years ago and I had a poster still have a, a poster hanging in my um, home studio that I just started going through all the names of the bands and if you listen to the band the, the song you can hear all the uh, oh that's cool mentioned. and Steve Wynn was like uh, the headliner at that festival so that was Steve and the Miracle 3 was his band called with his his wife Linda plays drums, and then there's you know, um, what other songs? Um, I guess Barfly Friends, title, not the title track, but the uh, yeah, uh, came together pretty quickly too. That's awesome. So, like, so one thing I find interesting is like. Songs like uh like back in the neighborhood and like a uh, uh-huh. stuck in the van like those type of tunes were like when you first kind of said that I'm like oh I bet those because they're so kind of it sounds like pulling from memories like oh that had to be just like oh that fell out yeah but it's back in the na- back in my old neighborhood was um I actually that was the first time I got out of a house during the pandemic and I went driving around my old neighborhood that I used to live in in Chicago. And it's really not a, yeah, that song did just happen after that drive that I took. And again, it's not like a masterpiece of the song, but it did did turn out in a pretty fun way. And then uh, Stuck in the Van was actually based on a former band 
that I was in that I toured a lot in the U.S. in the 90s. Is that called Sway the Sway Train? train. Yeah, okay. Sway Train. And um, so that was just like based on all the experiences that we had traveling in the U.S., playing at all these clubs, you know, in the in the in the Midwest and then on the East Coast quite a bit too. Um, and I know that you now there's a couple of lines about spending the night on the the Jersey Shore or spending the night at we used to do what a lot of bands do when you don't have, you know, money to spend on hotels. You like see if you can meet someone that night that you can crash at their house. <laughs> And we did that quite a bit. Sometimes it was good, and sometimes it was not a great idea, you know. But yeah. when you're in your 20s, it seems like it doesn't matter that much, you know. <laughs> Just anything to stretch out of the van. <laughs> like, yeah, anything to get out of that freaking van. So you, you, know? and, you and Brian were in the suede chain. What was like, before the Great Crusades, what was like kind of a... Was it, did that band just fizzle out or was it like just an artistic? Well, we, we new had a uh, Brian Hunt and I, he's the bass player in the Barfly Friends and the Great Crusades. Um, we had like a regional hit, this song called Daisy Dawn, which got major airplay on my like, uh, job in Chicago, St. Louis, and Champaign Urbana, basically. And that album even though it was an indie record, sold quite a bit. And then um, we made a second record, and the second record wasn't quite as well-received as that uh, that first record. And then it was kind of like, you know, everybody was in their late 20s, and everybody was kind of, you know, ready to... I'm not sure why it quite fizzled out. I always wanted to make a third record, and I still... I'm in contact with the band, you know, but uh, it, it was just one of those things where I think one guy moved out to LA, another guy moved out to, uh, Brian moved to Chicago, um, Matt and Mary were sort of, they were in a relationship in the band too, and uh, yeah, it just sort of, I won't say fizzled out, but it just kind of ran out of gas. Yeah, it was like everybody was uh, ready to do start so-called real lives. <laughs> Is that like when you and Brian started? Were you like writing in the kind of style of the Great Crusades, like in in that period, or like? Yeah, that- I, I wrote the the first record was called the First Bill Drink of the Evening, um, and I wrote that on tour with the uh, suede chain I would be riding while we were doing shows and I would just be we had this 15 passenger van with a trailer and uh, you had uh, a certain day that you would get to spend the day in the bed in the back of the 15 passenger you know that was like a like a chosen thing <laughs> and then so yeah, whenever I got to spend the day, you know, by myself and back in the the back of the van in the bed, it would be like, this is a perfect opportunity to write songs, you know? And I, I actually wish that I had done that more with the suede chain. I was more into the, like the, uh, I don't know, what was my job in the suede chain? Putting up posters and putting in trying to get the word out about gigs i think that's you know something that i would tell anybody that's that's, starting out in music is to like write songs don't think so much about like uh becoming a huge rock star or, or like trying to get your band popular it's like just write songs, you know, see how many songs you can write and see how, and then send, send the songs out to different people too, to try to get people to collaborate with. That's something I, I wish I would have done in my 20s, just spend a day 
or spend like you know a couple hours a day and try to write a batch of songs and then keep doing that that's what you're going to be known as you're not going to be known as like a great guitarist you're not going to be known as a i mean there's a few there's a handful of people that will be known as great instrumentalists but if you really want to make your name, it's it's, it's going to be about the songs that you, you know, and the stories that you tell. So, I think so that's, that's my advice to younger musicians. <laughs> I think that's wise wise words, and like I think that's that's the hardest thing to do is just to like write bad songs and let one become good, you know, or like or one happens to be good and it doesn't, you know, what I mean, but just that it because writing's got like this it's so focus it's so much focus in a way it, it's like a this like kind of mythos of the inspirado the inspiration if it's not there it's a it's a herculean task you know sure yeah and, like, it can be yeah like, yeah well there's no doubt about that that's for sure some days nothing's happening but it's right. like if you make that space to allow creative association to occur and you practice uh -huh. making that space, I think it happens a little more uh, easily. Or like, or, you, or you, you at least you start to fill out more notebooks and more your, your notes app with with uh, nonsense lyrics and chord progressions and your voice memos gig right. ram up. And like, <laughs> yeah. Um, but so, so a lot of that early Great Crusade uh, tunes came from the back of the van. That's, right. That's awesome. And like, were you? Yeah. Did you have like a little thing to record with, or were you just writing it down in? At that point, no. Okay. So this is like in the uh, mid '90s. So I didn't even have a phone, you know, at that point. Right. I well, did have like a. I did have like a handheld cassette tape recorder. Yeah. You know, but it was mostly the words, and I and it was kind of a. The new record, this is kind of a throwback to that. I mean, I did have, after I wrote the song, you know, I would uh, have all the lyrics basically almost done and the chord progressions and record just the voice memo, which I would send to Christian Motor. And he basically picked his favorite tunes. You know, and those were the ones that we worked on. And then after, you know, sending him 25 tunes that I did like that, then we started re-recording them, you know, or recording them, actually, yeah. not re-recording them. Well, it's um, different going from, like, a demo where it's just, like, idea, I think you should go here, you know what I mean, to, like, an actual yeah. demo. Like, it's weird. There's the pre-demo demo. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's a craft. It's like a, it's an art. It's like, it's a art form that, you know, it can happen easily and it can happen painfully, you know, and sometimes, I don't know, I think Tom Waits was always like, a, it's his famous saying about songs are like going fishing, you know, Sometimes you go fishing and you don't catch anything, and then sometimes you go out and you get one, and then sometimes you know, get a handful of tunes. You know, you have to go fishing to try to catch them. Anyway, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, what's the? Is there? What's? Isn't there an? Uh, what's the show where it's Tom Waits fishing with a? Uh, is it John Fishing Laurie? John. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> John Laurie. Yeah. yeah, that's a that show is hilarious. I don't know how many episodes he did, but that was uh oh my god, the one he did with uh Matt Dillon and uh the other ones um Dennis Hopper, I think. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just crazy stuff. My drum, my drummer got me really into, uh, or got me hip to um, John Laurie and that show, and he's also a real big Tom Waits guy. 
All okay. the drummers I know in my life are Tom Waits guys. I don't know if you. I don't know if you've picked <laughs> if that totally. trend. I think he, he uses a lot of interesting. I don't know if it's the players that he picks or just his style too. But he uses like a lot of interesting percussion sounds too, yeah. like the death like machine, the bone machine instruments. Yeah, yeah. Like I know on swordfish trombones, there's like sounds like a they're playing like a junkyard or something like that. You know. So. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you you play guitar or do Yeah, you... I sing and play guitar. I'm, I'm okay. trying to song craft and trying to dive into the mind of the writer and that's why I like I I really appreciate advice and and like insight to oh. how you craft. Like so. Oh, for sure, for sure. <laughs> Mike Spiegel here. You just listened to Zig at the Gig Podcast. Keep riding the bebop. See you, Space Cowboy. Bang.